for, for um, joining us. Um, I'm really going to just be sharing with you today um, a research agenda um, that we've been working on for a little while, but is really early stage in many ways. It builds on our ongoing um, uh, sort of uh, cyclical research, um, uh, and this um, round has been funded like previous rounds by the, by the IDRC, which we are very grateful for. Um, I will speak about different components that we are looking at and new um, areas of work that we are really looking forward to um, collaborating with um, people in this group and, and, and other economists um, that can bring a sort of wealth of expertise that we need for the kind of um, questions that we are moving on to and looking at. Um, so historically, Research ICT Africa has really focused on, um, you know, first broadcasting and telecommunications and then ICT and then digital policy and governance um, policy and regulation. Um, and increasingly, we've been forced to look at, at issues of data governance, um, data justice um, in matters of internet governance. Um, but with this project, we are really um, responding, and it's always been a, a multidisciplinary approach, um, you know, very informed by political economy. Um, but this round, we really have a number of uh, critical um, economic challenges, op op economic questions that we really would like to um, uh, collaborate on, 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 on tackling. Um, so the previous work has really been looking at, um, you know, poor, or po positive or negative, but generally um, unsatisfactory policy um, outcomes, digital policy outcomes, um, across the continent, we do work across the continent, um, and particularly in South Africa, where we've worked um, at various stages with um, at the sectoral level, at the competition level, competition commission level, and at the national planning um, commission level. Um, but a lot of the work has really been about the ICT sector getting, you know, compliance at a, a data governance and um, risk mitigation level. Um, but increasingly, we've been forced to look at uh, a digitization and datification, these massive global trends that have accompanied globalization um, in a far more um, across all public and private sectors, across um, um, economies and jurisdictions increasingly, and really far more at a, at a global level. So this um, part of the research also um, looks at the interplay between global governance and, and national governance and the increasing need for us to engage at the global level if we are going to um, realize these public goods at, at the national level. Um, so I'm really going to just uh, tell you how we've got to this research. Um, it really was uh, prompted by um, the debates over the last couple of years around the Green New Deal. And um, we'd already um, got this grant and started working in this area right before um, the pandemic uh, really took hold um, in Africa. And so very much um, supplemented and, and um, focused um, by COVID-19 on, on digital inequality, which is at the, at the heart of the work that we do. Um, and so we'd, pr we'd proposed, um, as I said, really prompted by some of the Green New Deal debates, um, but also the um, lack of uh, positive digital outcomes, the lack of connectivity, the very poor um, internet level uh, penetration rates we were seeing um, after our last 2018, um, after access survey, nationally representative surveys across the countries, where least developed countries were, um, you know, had internet penetration rates of, 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 of less than 10%, you know, poster child um, countries um, of, the, um, of the development banks. Um, Rwanda only had 10% um, internet penetration um, in 2018. So trying to understand why, you know, um, even for some countries that had um, successfully reformed markets and reasonably efficient levels or effective levels of, of regulation weren't um, able to reach these critical masses that are associated with um, GDP growth, with, with, gro with growth and development more generally. Um, so basically in this um, African new, um, digital deal, we are in line with that, we, we're really looking at what kind of um, new policy, you know, um, 
adjustments we can make, not even adjustments, what new policy forms, what experiments we can actually undertake with policy to get different outcomes. It's just clear that we can't do what we've done before and expect um, different results. So I'll speak about that a little bit. And then I'll speak a, um, a little bit, if we get time, about the need for, for global cooperation, um, especially now, um, but even prior to this, um, in order to, to realize these uh, public goods at the national level. Um, referring to the um, global digital tax that's being referred to um, on these big um, uh, platforms, these big global monopolies um, that are, um, you know, extracting enormous revenues through what's being called, you know, um, surveillance capitalism without any um, uh, contribution back into the, to the tax base and into the social protections um, required in those countries. Um, and then I'm going to be looking at what this main project now that we've just got um, from IDRC, um, which is a longer term project, trying to understand um, the potential of digitization. So there are a lot of negative things we've been looking at, but trying to understand the um, conditions of di global digitalization that um, allow us to potentially allow governments to make visible um, uh, informal sector firms, and individuals and households um, for a new fiscal co um, social compact that would uh, enable the provision of greater social protections and um, you know, social investments and, and redistribution that we currently um, don't have the resources uh, to, 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 to undertake. Um, so really, as I said, you know, the, 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 the COVID-19 um, pandemic has really just and brought into very stark relief the, the implications of this digital inequality that we've been struggling with and which this project was anyway going to address. Um, but it seems to have created a policy window in that, um, you know, in governments, presidencies, uh, donors are suddenly looking at, you know, they've all been terribly distracted by the, the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence, and all sorts of other um, sexy things to fund. And they've suddenly said, oh my goodness, we've just dropped the uh, kind of digital divide, digital inequality agenda, and we really need to, need to go back there. Um, and so we've really seen, you know, the, the impacts of this, um, you know, lock, these lockdowns at a, at a national and, and, and global level, um, affecting people's ability not to, you know, just to work or, or play or school online, but really from a survival point of view, from, you know, the most basic um, livelihoods with a disruption of informal value chains, um, to simply not being able to, um, you know, digitally um, file for food relief or business relief. Um, so this new social compact that I'm just going to summarize very briefly because I'm going to go through it now and we might actually not get to the to the end. But essentially what we are doing is that, you know, a lot of the things we are proposing still are, are, are going to be challenges in Africa because of the, cha you know, the challenges around capable states, um, institutional endowments in countries, um, and of course the, the, the poverty and underdevelopment from a demand side of, of the population. But it will require a competent state. It is going to require um, you know, institutional capacity. We may have to adjust our policies so that they, we do have um, you know, the institutional capacity to implement them rather than you know, going for the, for the Rolls Royce on everything. But it, it will require a real commitment from the state. And when I talk, talk about the state, I'm talking about, sorry, regulatory bodies um, uh, and you know, competition authorities, et cetera, not just um, the, the, the state at the, at the national level. Um, and then what we're saying again, drawing in from the other work, our own work, um, and of course from the New Deal, is that we'll need to be crowding in public investments. Um, so, th sorry, private investments that should be. So the public investments can focus on these more economic um, or uneconomic areas, um, and, and where we have these service challenges. We need to be conducting low risk experimentation in markets structure, alternative access strategies and business modeling. This is stuff we could be doing right now with various things like temporary spectrum that we're doing. We're doing the same old big style things that haven't worked for a long time. Obviously some of those bigger licensing auctions and things will have to go on, but we're not looking at the opportunities on the sidelines that could have brought lots of people right now online through um, micro networks, micro providers, um, like the Wireless Association, with 150 people who applied for, for licenses under the temporary spectrum didn't get any. Um, so the, the opportunities there that we miss get, we're missing, and we really, um, especially in developing countries, need to, need to focus on that. And then we need to be very careful in this very different environment from the old telecom, telecoms infrastructure environment 
of the dangers of instrumental competition regulation. Um, you know, these old um, competition regulation models used for sector regulation and sometimes by competition um, authorities that don't um, account for and don't understand the sort of dynamic efficiency models that are required. Um, and the, you know, adaptive, flexible regulation that is required to deal with the levels of global complexity that we're dealing with. Um, and so it's also going to be really important to engage, as I said, in the global and regional governance of, of these public goods and these processes. I'm going to quickly focus now on some of these issues of globalization, digitization and inequality. Um, and uh, as I said, we, we really were you know, inspired to do this, to put forward this um, original proposal very much by the, by the Green Deal. But basically, uh, you know, I'm very quickly going to quote from here, and then, you know, there are no quick fix to the problems of um, hyper-globalization and our endeavors to do so, especially the kind of technological interventions that, you know, we set up a fourth industrial revolution council and then we're going to deal with all the problems of, you know, backlogs of lack of digitalization and digital inequality. In fact, the application of these tech logically driven um, interventions without addressing um, you know the underlying inequalities actually exacerbate and amplify um, these inequalities as we as we're currently seeing um, and and basically what they were calling for was a rebalancing you know globalization and the existing age of anxiety um, and this you know the, we really can't tinker around the edges it's going to require far more profound change in our thinking and the policy mix that has caused these problems um, in the first place so I think it's, it's really a challenge to us to think, um, you know, very differently about how we, we address these problems. And also, you know, the structural long-term problems that we, we are not going to be able to address immediately, demand side, you know, challenges that we're not going to address into, um, immediately. But there are um, strategies that can alleviate some of these problems in, in the shorter term. Um, but basically, there are no fix to these problems of hyper-globalization, of which, of course, you know, digitization and, and, and datification are, are critical elements um, of that. And that's what we focus on, that perhaps the, the New Green Deal does not as much, um, focusing rather on, on, on you know, decarbonization and, and, and climate issues. Um, but a lot of the same issues actually apply and are driven by, um, you know, uh, digital services and digital global platforms as prioritizing very narrow financial interests um, that have created a very unsustainable and inequitable world resulting stagnant wages we've seen, crippling levels of debt, the recurrence of these financial crises um, and creating an increasingly um, dangerously unbalanced world, um, rigged markets, corporate rentierism, dearth of productive investments that are hobbling economic recovery and, and long-term transformation. And just in that spirit, the, sort of the broad aim is to catalyze a big transformative push, breaking with austerity economics, promoting public investment and crowding in productive private investment, the levelling of the playing field for working families everywhere, while the appropriate mixture of recovery, regulation and redistribution will vary across countries and with policy experimentalism of particular importance in developing countries, all policymakers still usefully recall the original um, deal, etc. And what they go on to say is that it's really in addressing these issues, it's going to be important to um, leverage at the global level um, because of the interdependencies that we have. Um, you know, to, to realize these things at, 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 the, um, at the national level, we're going to have to uh, mobilize at the, at the global level. And I'm not going to deal with these in, in, in very much detail, but of course these problems were, were, were um, challenged, you know, um, exacerbated in, in developing countries with premature deindustrialization, and which resulted in heightened vulnerability to these shocks. But we also see some commonality in advanced economies with a um, surge in response to this crisis of informality, um, that resources are lost to transactional pricing, um, years of uh, low investment resulting in, in infrastructure, inadequate infrastructures that are now common to many countries, not all countries, of course, but developing and undeveloped countries. And this is something we're going to pick, um, pick up a little bit later when we speak about this um, use of digitization, possibly um, to uh, increase the tax base and to um, uh, provide social protection. So this African new digital deal in response um, is basically, you know, acknowledging or, and in fact, acknowledging both the problems and the potential of these global processes of digitization and datification that cut across, you know, economy and society. And the importance of this from a policy perspective 
um, that is that they cannot, it's not that they don't require, they cannot operate on a sort of, you know, sectorally siloed approach. They require a transversal national strategy um, that is able to deal both with the supply side and demand side challenges. And at the moment, we are still, especially in South Africa, but across the continent, we are still stuck in these, you know, very much these sectoral um, policies, which are not getting the, the benefits of, um, you know, public and private coordination, across um, public sector coordination, etc. But the challenges that we really need to deal with from a policy perspective are this digital equality, inequality paradox that I'll speak about, this, this core challenge, which has been described by somebody in the UN as a, you know, the biggest challenge after climate change, the, the um, challenge of organizing at a global level, um, you know, at a governance level, uh, economies and societies and, and individuals, because many of them operate in this digital realm outside of those, um, to address the issue of, of the digital inequality paradoxes. As you connect more people, um, they, uh, they are, there's increasingly digital inequality. And also, of course, as we move into a data environment, an internet environment, digital environment, this is not simply between the connected and the unconnected. It's also um, between those who are barely online and using tiny bits of data, um, you know, simply to do the most basic things, and those who have both the resources, um, you know, skills, but also financial resources um, to, you know, consume more actively or even to, to, to produce um, and contribute to the prosperity of nations. Um, so it's really important that this is, you know, integrated across government departments, it cannot be sectoral, and of course it also requires this capable state that we mentioned of, that is not necessarily um, delivering these services, but is required to create the necessary um, coordination of the public, private and um, uh, civil society um, to produce these public goods. Um, and so the, what we also, one of the areas that we're looking at is that this um, global public goods such as the internet are going to require much greater levels of, of, of global cooperation. Um, uh, this, and we look, we've of course been following and looking and arguing that African governments need to get much more involved in the um, OECD G20, a global digital tax, which is meant to come into play this year, but might be pushed out for with COVID because of all the pressures um, on, on, on international financing. Um, um, and then also just to say that you know this this global governance is also necessary to uh, from a governance from a, a regulatory and governance point of view to mitigate the harms and risks associated with being online that also we've tended to look you know very sectorally at so we've got some sort of infrastructure and people looking at infrastructures not really speaking very much to the people who need to create the necessary trusted environment governance environment for you know e-commerce um, a secure internet from a cyber security point of view we just had of one of our big health systems um, hacked um, yesterday. Germany's had a very big hack that's um, uh, impacting on their economy. So these are all you know, things that have to be understood together. Um, and then, as I said, I'm gonna speak a little bit more about the potential of these new forms of um, formalization of micro and informal firms um, that through digital visibility have the potential to increase the tax base for um, social protection and social investments. And um, that has been such a challenge um, if, one you know looks at the literature for so long in um, uh, actually getting economic growth while we have such high levels of informality um, or sustained growth. So this um, uh, new digital deal from a, a governance point of view is um, looking beyond um, the sort of digitalization issues. So this um, uh, graphic, um, infographic re really was drawn from the very core um, from a World um, Development Bank report in 2016, a very good one that we, we worked on, that um, was basically looking at the, if, you know, if you didn't get the analog environment right, the, the institutional environment right, you were going to have problems in the, in the digital world. So if you didn't actually get inclusion, you had inequality. If you didn't get, you know, efficiency, um, you got um, a co a concentration and in the market and if you, you, know, you didn't get innovation, et cetera. So it's really just looking at these and, and looking at what um, the institutional arrangements that are required in order to realize these, but basically to address the issues of digital inequality 
um, through, you know, by ensuring greater access, by ensuring greater affordability through, through, through price and other regulation, um, and then ensuring that the, we have an open and safe internet as a result of this, this digitalization. And obviously that's basically the connectivity and, and um, uh, divide. Um, but then also it's important to understand the impacts of, of datafication. And of course, datafication is, you know, driving the, the, the gig economy and it's, um, you know, it's been compared to oil erroneously, I think. Um, but it's, you know, it has this enormous value that we also need to um, uh, appreciate and um, extract for the, you know, for the public good what is required, what is required from it. So, so regulate it in, in a way that um, doesn't inhibit innovation, but allows uh, the enormous revenues that are being generated from um, um, platforms, etc., to um, come back to the countries in which those revenues are being generated. Um, so basically, the, uh, the other side of this datafication is really the risk mitigation that goes with these massive amounts of data in relation to human rights and privacy, and that's really a, another whole set of work that um, I will refer to briefly from a global governance point of view because it's integrated with some of the economic regulation, trade and, and tax regulation. But um, there we're really concerned with the issues of you know, the importance of, of data being open where it is appropriate for that to be. Um, you know, issues of privacy, um, you know, the COVID-19 contact tracing, all of these things that are now using you know, mobile data or um, other data, platform data, issues of privacy, transparency, and then um, competency. So building skills, the same skills that one requires in order to um, you know, bank online, etc. One also needs um, literacy skills in terms of um, protecting your, your, your rights online. So quite a bit of the work is done around those frameworks um, and we've been working with, with SADC and the African Union on that. Um, so very quickly, I'm just I'm just going to take you through this broader framing because this is really the area that we are um, have just uh, started working on and it's a it's a three-year project and we are really looking forward to collaborating people as I said it's, it's taken us into um, areas that um, you know we've always been concerned with e-trade or with um, e-taxation e um, but uh, this is really about um, you know understanding a, a uh, digitalization at the macro level and in, um, really leveraging it in order to um, uh, contribute to uh, the tax bases and, and to, to social protection etc and it's drawing from this um, reference that I, that I have up there by Dix um, Camero, Goldberg, Magir, um, Ulysses, I actually think I've left a name off there, you, um, you'll see her. Um, but basically what it does is looks at the convergence between um, economic and social conditions, with there are several caveats here, um, between developing and developed countries because of uh, digitization um, impact on, 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 you know, on globalization, or globalization's impact on digitization maybe, but basically that it's changed the nature of the firm, it's changed the nature of work, um, and it's uh, changed the basis for social protection. So, in terms of the changing nature of work, and I seem to have um, left out the changing nature of the firm, but basically the, the changing nature of the firm does refer to the informality, formality, which I will come to on the, on the next slide. Um, but basically the changing nature of work means that labour markets are, are more fluid and there's much greater self-employment. Um, they're no longer long-term contracts. People are working um, either just micro work on very small contracts or short-term contracts or freelancing, and there's far less regulation, if any, in certain areas. On the social protection side, the formal wage and um, employment contract, um, which was the common basis for, for, for protection, um, minimum wage, severance pays, et cetera, um, have, have diminished a lot. And basically um, people are, you know, have commercial contract um, arrangements that provide them with no social protections um, at all. And from the work that we've done on micro work from our surveys, we've also seen the um, mirroring of patterns of, of north-south exploitation and different patterns of, of, um, of national exploitation um, from a labor and a rights point of view. Um, and also we've seen that essentially the um, kind of uh, micro work or online work that's being done in Africa is essentially still manual labor that's just sourced from a, you know, from a, a, an economic um, uh, 
platform, uh, sorry, not an economic platform, an electronic platform um, or source of some kind. Um, so that's really um, affecting um, the, uh, you know, uh, economies across the world, obviously to different degrees and obviously in terms of the digital inequality I've spoken about, um, this is not um, widespread as it is in, in more mature economies, but moving forward as we do get more people online, um, even just for banking and for you know minimal procurement and that kind of thing, um, it, it has the potential uh, to fulfill this role. So essentially, um, this is also um, taken from um, uh, Penelope Goldberg, the sh short-lived chief economist at the, the Development Bank, um, who was uh, uh, the author of those original texts that I was speaking about, but also pre presented a, a fabulous course lecture at LSE last year, who was um, arguing that potentially we need to rethink informality, and those of you who've worked in this area will know that there's a very diverse literature on informality. Um, but largely, it, it demonstrates that um, as long as there are high levels of informality, um, you know, firms remain small, firms um, often um, disappear, they don't um, grow for expansion very often, um, and they certainly, um, it's associated with um, limited you know, productivity gains or, re or re productivity reductions and um, uh, um, GDP growth as well. Um, on the other hand, there is a large body of literature on the um, uh, role of inf um, in the informal sector to serve as a buffer um, uh, under crisis and especially in the developing uh, world with these economic shocks that we've experienced. And so the thinking about this informality is that um, although the digitization may allow people to become visible, um, and therefore, um, if available, if they earn sufficient, obviously it's not for everybody, but um, if they be, um, become um, visible to the state, they can contribute to the tax base, which could be extended to ensure that there is adequate um, social protection, which they, they currently um, tends not to be. Um, and of course, this is part of a wider social compact because um, states of you know, developing country states, of many African states have also um, not really fulfilled that um, social compact and that they haven't invested, you know, there hasn't been social investment or much protection. Um, but, you know, were the system to become um, uh, uh, viable, um, then it might mean that we could get rid of some of the more less efficient, um, you know, retrogressive taxing that is there. Um, and those who are online that don't have any protection could get protections, but of course those who are offline could also come. So under a crisis like we've had now, we would have a much wider um, safety net and, and people would officially, even if they are not contributing taxes, be um, registered in such a way that they could um, benefit from these uh, social protections and relief. Um, so the um, new economy combines the efficiencies and advantages of large firms, these big international platforms, etc., with the flexibility um, afforded by short-term work arrangements that are both advantageous to firms and, and to um, individuals. So. Um, this work is, is also being done across the global south again, as was our micro work um, and, and, and new economy work and the after access surveys of the last round. So this will be done in um, South Asia and in, in Latin America as well. Um, and um, essentially, you know, the, 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 the cell is that um, this could provide the basis of a, of a new social compact and it could be based on these new linkages between um, digitization and datification um, that may um, have provide ways of making informal labor um, enterprises, production and consumption units, households um, more visible to the state, expand the database. Um, and together with these global taxation measures that have been spoken about, and of course, these are the people <laughs> who've been making, you know, maybe the only people who've been making enormous profits during the, the pandemic, um, to provide, uh, you know, uh, revenues, capital um, for the currently absent safety nets. So there's this potential dual role of SMEs of the informal sector to act with those as a buffer due to their flexibility, um, but also to, um, you know, contribute in ways that are more associated with the formal sector um, to, to, the, to the tax base and to receive the social benefits that they might currently not be receiving. Um, yes, so that, I mean, that has a whole ramification in terms of, you know, accessing universal basic income grants, etc., which um, I'm not going to have time to go into now. And the importance of this is that, um, you know, especially under the conditions of the pandemic, but even under the global conditions that we were speaking about prior, and because of the 
global nature of these uh, of, of these digital and datafication trends. Um, it is important if we're going to see the benefits of these or leverage the benefits of this, that new forms of global and regional governance and collaboration um, will be necessary um, to um, realize these global public goods like the internet um, at, a, at a national level and to prevent the harms associated with them. Um, so, yeah, as I said, the, the importance of the tax base is that it could substitute for some of these very um, negative or retrogressive taxes that are in place, social networking taxes, etc., that are effectively taxes on the poor, and also very um, uh, negative taxes on, on mobile companies, etc. I know it sounds odd in terms of the profits they make, but in many countries, the taxes are, are really um, very, very high and actually push up the prices, etc. So there's a, a whole um, really interesting um, tax solution there with, with a global digital tax and because it tangibly offers governments who really often don't have any other alternatives, you know, de not deindustrialized, non-industrialized economies, um, really the mobile companies are often the only, only players in town. Um, the important thing about this and that really sort of I think quite exciting um, analysis is that um, the assumptions around the um, shared conditions in developing and developed countries uh, are not really there, are not quite there. Um, and although, I mean, you know, at a global level, you would have a, a global elite or with the, those kinds of access and, you know, certainly there's um, taxation there that should be, should be levied, etc. But in terms of the pervasiveness of, um, of digitization, of datification, of, of um, internet penetration, and um, we, we don't see, actually see that um, in Africa, certainly, although we do see it much more in, in Latin America um, and parts of Asia. Um, but as I said, you know, the, the real challenge in dealing with the new digital deal is actually um, within this broader sort of macro framework, actually um, going back to addressing some of the bottlenecks, some of the challenges that are producing this digital inequality that I, that I spoke about. Um, and so really this, this whole project is um, I, was intended ask, even prior COVID, yes. Can I ask a question? Yes. With respect to yes. the digital divide paradox. Um, yes. So, so uh, you say that uh, as more people are connected, the digital inequality increases. And uh, I wonder, so is the statement uh, as, as such, uh, what sort of measure uh, involves of uh, digital inequality? Uh, what is meant that that it increases? Is it about income inequality or is it about uh, skills or? So um, I'm actually going to show you a few um, uh, slides that uh, speak to, to digital inequality, but it's an important point because we are not, you know, for us, the um, digital inequality paradox really emerges with, um, with, with, um, you know, with data, with um, datafication and, and, and um, uh, internet, et cetera. So um, we found it with mobile phones too. So we, we are distinguishing digital inequality or the digital inequality paradox from the digital divide issues, which were really about connectivity. With a basic phone, um, you know, whether you were connected or not, that was the inequality issue. And once you were connected, if you had enough money, and of course they always is that qualification around affordability, then you know you were able to use the phone in a very similar way to somebody else. The, the, the levels, the, the sort of size of the inequality was, was very different. Whereas once we move into a data environment, the demand side challenges become so much greater. That's why, for example, you have in South Africa, you know, we've got over 95% broadband penetration, even higher, and um, broadband penetration. There are very few parts of the country that don't have any signal at all. Some don't have competitive signals and all sorts of things, but there's, you know, basically 95% coverage. And yet we only have 50% of the population um, online. So, you know, that really um, identifies the, the, the demand side challenges. The supply side side been taken care of there. Clearly affordability issues. But as, as I said, if you put those on, a, on the demand side, so pricing is the supply side issue, affordability, the demand side issue. But in South Africa, you know, those 50% who are not online from our modeling and across Africa and across the globe with our partners, we know that those who are not online, um, you know, the determinant of, of, of being offline, the determinant of being online is education. 
with the you know corollary of, 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 of um, income um, those are really what what determine people so digital inequality um, really reflects the structural inequalities that we are seeing in our in our society but what we see with the pandemic is that they are also reinforcing those inequalities so that you know um, people who are able to you know university students are able to go online and those who aren't able to go online it's, it's, it's also reinforcing those inequalities, not only reflecting them. And that's why we, you know, we've been arguing that addressing this um, uh, digital inequality issue is, is absolutely critical to um, uh, survival during the, the pandemic and lockdown, but also for our economic recovery going forward, if we're going to have this um, new, more in, equitable environment that we're talking about. All right, thank you. I'm going to just do a few more slides. You might want to comment on those when, when they're there. When we're there, um, I'm just having a look here. How are we doing for for time? Oh, we still have time. Okay. Um, so so really, as I said, what, what's perhaps just in the South African context, um, because there's um, been so much hype around this. I think you know what the, the the pandemic's just shown us is that we've you know we completely abandoned a lot of our um, digital policy agenda. Our, broadband, uh, SA Connect, a number of things. Um, and we've diverted all our energies, as have many, many international donors, I should add, towards the, you know, the, the, the World Economic Forum hype around the fourth industrial revolution, smart cities, artificial intelligence, et cetera. And the important part of this uh, digital inequality um, paradox is actually, from a policy point of view, is um, sort of countering this you know, technological solutions, technological determinism, and actually demonstrating that, you know, technologies don't necessarily translate into economic development, wage growth or productivity. We've got lots of evidence of this. And indeed, what we do see is that digital technology can in fact um, increase inequality rather than alleviate it. And that is, you know, the, the point that we've reached globally as well. So, for example, you know, if you look at um, broadband, uh, sorry, internet uh, penetration rates, um, you see that it broadly attacks um, GNI per capita. Even those countries that have really sort of, you know, got a lot of things together, like Colombia, which is a much lower income country, actually, than many of its counterparts there, um, is actually, you know, um, it's still a, a, you know, a low, low middle, middle income um, country and so it, it scores there and you know other countries are further down. So at the bottom end what you don't get right can really make a difference but broadly we see that um, you know uh, countries uh, internet penetration basically tracks the um, uh, GNI per capita and so South Africa um, is up there with the middle income countries and performs Similarly, relatively well in terms of mobile phone ownership, but its actual internet use is, is far lower. And of course, what these aggregated figures um, mask is the inequalities. So, you know, the national, the, the GNI per capita masks those inequalities, and the internet penetration also masks those um, masks those inequalities in South Africa and other countries, but with, you know, with our very high Gini coefficient. And then just to, to give you some sense of um, what these divides are. So if we look at the, the gender gap, we actually see that it's not as bad as the urban and rural divide. And the, um, as I said, what, what is underlying this is actually um, is, is education and income. Um, so there do seem to be um, some advantages of simply being in an urban, urban area but very often those also accompany access to education and various other things. So it's, it's, it's a little more complicated than it looks, but I think you know, for a long time there was, uh, and obviously there are cultural factors that inform who gets the education, et cetera, um, so in terms of gender inequality and that. But the actual, um, you know, broadly speaking, and it's a little, little bit crude, but broadly speaking, men and women of a similar income, um, education and income group, um, other than some particularly you know, complex um, cultural environments in Asia um, have a similar access, access to education. And then the important thing in terms of the short-term measures that are being um, uh, promoted, um, you know, both from presidency and from the Competition Commission and um, you know, even in the sort of 
policy by hashtag data must fall is this lack of realization that we only have 50% of the population online. And that, you know, while relief on data actually um, is helpful for a lot of people who can't afford the, the high prices, and they are high, um, we, we, you know, we can't just be dealing with that issue without addressing how we get the 50% who are offline online. And very often, you know, those are affected. So if you, um, you know, for example, propose a, um, a living data or universal data um, a package um, as proposed by the Competition Commission, you know, that is going to help those who are online. But it doesn't actually get people online, which is the way that, you know, that it's framed. And in fact, you know, there's a lot of literature on the, on the problems of that when essentially it's a, it's a kind of elite that's online, probably the last 10, 15 percent, you know, probably not, not so much. But basically it's an elite online and you are, you know, subsidizing the elite, you're paying because the only way to do it is to give everybody with a SIM card. There's no way of uh, contracting in or anything on this. So you know, then uh, there's a whole problem, a, a, a free rider problem. Um, so the problem with the, 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 the barriers, you know, the primary barrier to those not coming online is the cost of the device. The device is, is, is just too expensive um, for people. Um, and yeah, so, and as I said, you know, the, the cost of the device is part of a much bigger um, GSM business model. It's a, it's a model, a very successful global model that's brought, you know, um, telephony and, and communications throughout the world. But it's an expensive technology. It's an expensive of solution and um, you know it, it would be really important to be looking at alternative technologies low-cost technologies at least aggregated public access um, but also low-cost technologies that would um, have lower devices lower mobile stations etc and then there are of course very big issues around getting um, greater fiber connectivity um, although fiber is very expensive to to take to the cur to take to the home um, is you know, worth getting to the curb anyway and then getting public Wi-Fi to connect people. The actual cost once you've connected is, is far lower than, than mobile technologies, which are very expensive. So basically, um, people have accessed the internet on, on, their, on their smartphones. The internet penetration rate basically, you know, is, is, is the same as the smartphone rate. And of course, you know, the, as I said, there is a problem with, with, the, with the cost of data, but you can't look at the issue of data on its own. One has to look at the data in terms of the environment that you've got, the policy and regulatory environment, the fact that you've got 95% um, you know, uh, coverage, et cetera. So if you take countries that are just above um, South Africa, um, I'm not sure about um, Algeria, but Mozambique, for example, you know, has um, very poor coverage. It's much better since the um, introduction of the third licensee, Viatel, who's just uh, aerial through. Um, rolling out um, to fiber, but um, you know the, the, the quality of the service, the um, penetration rate, the coverage rates, uh, the coverage levels are all, all very, very low. So South Africa is high. It's you know come down now. Again, you know an unintended consequence of this is that we're not dealing with the actual wholesale um, uh, anti-competitive behavior that in, in the wholesale market that's reflected in in the retail market. We've now push down the retail um, price to the price of the, the late entrance. So both MTN and Vodacom have now brought down that price to the price of um, Celsi and, and um, Telcom, which by the way, you know, people were voting with their feet. Right at the height of data must fall, people were not using these substantially lower services. They were paying to be on, on high quality services like Vodacom and MTN. Celsi didn't go up, Telcoms went up a little bit with the, the original price drops. Now we have a situation where they've forced the um, dominant operators' prices down so that all the operators now have a 99 rand price, which means the new, new entrants are now unable to compete both on price and quality. And so they're probably going to even lose more net risk, which is why they're so upset. Um, the Competition Commission does speak about the importance of doing the wholesale review, the wholesale um, regulation, um, which would have been the outcome of a market review that should have been done years ago. But without that in place, bringing down the prices, uh, retail prices for the um, incumbents, uh, <laughs> puts the late entrance in an even a worse situation. Um, so just, this was just to point out that we actually have very high quality of service in the, in the, in the dominant networks, in the um, big pairs, MTN and Vodacom. And, you know, 
the evidence suggests that people are prepared to pay the prime pre premium to get it. That doesn't mean that the prices shouldn't come down. It needs, it needs to have been act, uh, regulated in the wholesale market, allow the other entrants and ISPs to compete there and put pricing pressure um, from, um, from the offering of, of the, the retail products, but also a similar and competitive wholesale base. Um, so basically this problem of being unconnected has enormous economic implications for us that we have to, have to address. Um, these now critical you know, uh, global public goods like the internet are not available to the mass, vast majority of Africans, half of South Africans. In many countries, um, they're below this critical mass that's um, historically from the Roland Waverman work um, kind of determines when you see the, uh, well, at least there's the causality between the um, network, um, uh, sorry, not network, internet penetration rates and um, GDP uh, or GNI growth that, we, uh, that one sees. Um, and also the other thing around this critical mass work, which is an interesting aside, but I don't really have too much time to go into it, is that it's also done on the basis of always on networks, etc. So many countries, um, Kenya, um, Nigeria, even South Africa to some degree at, uh, at, at, in certain ways, um, even though they've passed these critical masses, because it's not always on, we're not getting the same um, you know, efficiencies, information flows in the economy, the network effects, the multiplier effects um, that would be associated with those kinds of uh, growth levels, et cetera. So for every 10%, one or 1.6% in developing countries um, was the, I think now rather debunked um, World Bank uh, thing for that, but there's certainly these, these, these correlations, but with the very low levels of usage, the lack of intensity of use, and therefore lack of innovation and various other things, we're not seeing all those multiplier effects. Um, and anyway, as, as I said, there's also big issues around the policy uncertainty. We've had flip-flops on spectrum, on um, uh, market reviews, on all sorts of things that um, have had negative impact on investments. But I should add, at the moment, you know, it's not been until potentially, you know, the wireless open access network and some challenges around um, uh, how that's going to work and you know whether they're capable of using the spectrum effectively or not. Um, the, in, the investments in the sector have been you know, just extraordinary. So the, the mobile investors and the, the big um, guys have been investing about um, 10 billion um, rand each per year over a long period of time. Um, but the main problem, of course, is on the, the low levels of human development, um, that we actually, you know, until some of these basic educational um, and, and e-literacy from that, but it's not just e-literacy, it's not just about, you know, us all doing coding and stuff, it's actually really a basic human development skills, um, we're going to be unable to, to leverage um, or harness the benefits of these technologies. Um, so then, as I said, the, the cost, certainly the quality of certain um, broadband is also not conducive to innovation at the very highest level that one would be talking about. Um, and therefore, very little um, contribution to, to prosperity. And I'm just going to go through this very quickly, but to point out from that World Development um, Report, uh, World Bank report I mentioned, is that the importance of these analog, what they call these analog conditions, in order to get the digital benefits are just enormous. So the, you know, the institutional failures, the regulatory uncertainty, the, the policy flip-flops, etc. these are really account for our quite poor showing for, for a middle-income country. And so in looking at these bigger issues that we were speaking about, um, you know, it's still important to assess the digital readiness for our, these digital futures that we're hoping um, um, to leverage. And so, you know, are policies geared towards maximizing the potential of the digital economy? Do we have the necessary, um, you know, data governance frameworks? Um, are they, uh, you know, harmonized with global governance systems? And, you know, what are we actually doing to rectify digital um, inclusion or rectify digital exclusion? Um, because current policies are clearly um, not working. And then just this important point that the digital economy does transcend, you know, the ICT sector. Um, and, and many governments like South Africa are continuing to um, just address it at the infrastructure and um, services level. Obviously, that's a precondition, it's, it's necessary, but you have to understand it in, in a far more integrated way. And of course, more importantly, or equally importantly, is that it's not just a, a national um, uh, service, it's not just a national uh, policy environment that we're dealing with. You know, we need to look at it very much from a, a, an international environment where there are, you know, international governance frameworks, formal governance frameworks that affect us, like you know, ICANN and ITU and things that 
um, WTO, et cetera, that we are signatories to or not. And you know, we've now got e-commerce um, legislation for the WTO um, that uh, really need to be understood in a far more integrated way. So e-commerce under DTI and then you know, infrastructure under ITU and that we, it really needs to be understood. So if we um, you know, are going to try and leverage these technologies for employment and innovation, um, we need to create the conditions both for investment and human development um, to, to realize those and to respond to this increasingly complex um, ecosystem. So it's very clear that we can't do the same things and hope for different outcomes. Um, you know, we will have to do novel things. We'll have to um, uh, be innovative from a policy and a regulatory point of view. However, uh, the starting point for us, what we've, we've proposed with the a new digital deal, is that we actually um, look at what we should have done that we failed to do. And it's very clear if we'd even met <laughs> Through two thirds of the targets that we'd set in the um, SA Connect broadband plan, um, you know, connecting all schools, um, public Wi Fi at every public building, um, and then um, getting down the prices and the speeds and up sufficiently um, to have 50% uh, of the population serviced by 2016 and, um, uh, you know, 75 um, by now. So I'm not going to go into it now, but it's, you know, it, is important to do that diagnostic to understand you know the interplay between um, the institutional arrangements um, and the outcomes that we get um, in terms of affordability access use skills content you know broadband coverage digital equality um, that are you know our, 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 our policy touchstones and to understand that the failure to do the market review by the regulator 10 years ago has now impacted so negatively on our um, situations of dominance and and what we can we can do there and I'm, i i don't think there's time but i you know i just wanted to say that basically because of these institutional failures you get um a reactive response from the, the competition commission that's trying to deal kind of at the wrong end from a um a um, uh, ex post point of view rather than ex ante point of view through you know economic sector regulation which is there for a reason with some of the anti-competitive behavior that that we're seeing in the market and you know without it being addressed um, on the on the wholesale side we are you know, likely to have negative um, outcomes but um, I don't think we have um, time to to look at that just in terms of you know what we should have done besides the market review the other issue is, of course, spectrum. We've seen now with the temporary spectrum and with the auction that, you know, <laughs> um, if there is a political will, it can happen very quickly. We've wasted, you know, the opportunity cost of the economy have been enormous. The, um, uh, you know, ability to remain a, a leader, continental leader in this area, the very high cost um, refarming um, LTE spectrum or using LTE on refarm spectrum that operators have had to do, um, all been very, very negative um, for the sector. And had we actually dealt with these um, auction issues, which um, you will recall uh, ICASA wanted to do back in, in 2006 or something that it was, um, and was then you know, um, f f sued and countersued between the minister and the regulator, et cetera. And of course, the uh, mobile operators lobbying as well in there, they probably wish they hadn't now, seen without spectrum so many years later um, but uh, if, if some, many of these issues have been dealt with we wouldn't have had some of the um, policy into negative unintended consequences of policy interventions like the introduction of the wireless open access network which has caused you know um, havoc and uncertainty um, we would have actually been able to uh, you know move along with digital migration because you know ETV and the whole set up Dr. Barkle wouldn't even have you know it would all have been uh, it, would, it simply wouldn't have been there it would, would have been done years ago so there are really sort of policy bottlenecks that that we need to clear and one of them is of course just implementing some of our policy we've just failed to implement some of our policy so if we go back to our um, SA connect broadband policy a whole lot of things have been done in its name but very few of what was actually in the policy um, has been done particularly you know the leveraging of private sector investments in order to get um, fiber networks rolled out there. This was a consensus that was you know, really brought into by, by the operators. And essentially, it takes the pressure of government from 
um, uh, from um, capex, very big capex demands, which it simply now is you know, never going to be able to afford, to simply opex by being an anchor tenant, um, you know, um, but a, a um, open access wireless, uh, sorry, open access fiber operator like Dark Fiber or um, Convergence Partners or somebody could provide could provide the line. So this um, model um, got converted into a strange. Um, um, model where um, a failed operator, the you know, infrastructure, um, the broadband infrastructure company, the state broadband infrastructure became a kind of aggregator um, of different needs in the country, but the leveraging of, of, of private sector investment for this purpose was, was not achieved. Um, so really to, what we are doing... So, so I, just, I just would like to remind about the time so that we have some space for questions. So. Okay, I'm going to quickly, quickly just go through these two slides, um, just because I think they do provide a, for us a, um, a theoretical shift and a policy shift that might inform policies. Let me quickly, just quickly do that. Um, so basically what we've been asking ourselves in this kind of review of where we're at and why things haven't worked so far is what policy interventions could more equitably allocate resources, resources from spectrum to data to ensure meaningful access to quality public goods in a digital era. And basically, the, this is just the, what I wanted to share with you, um, is that over the last 25 years in South Africa's communication sector and in line with um, you know, um, WTO GATT reforms and um, you know, epistemic communities, banks, et cetera's best practice, um, policy reforms basically been driven by a commercial um, supply side valuation um, um, model. So you know, licenses um, were given to the people who could Pay the most for them. Um, in the initial days, there were some, you know, qualifications on those in terms of meeting some other public interest um, aspects. But uh, broadly, um, whether it's uh, privately, whether it's through licensing, um, basically, you know, the, the, the digital economy is driven by a supply side valuation of goods, which fails to acknowledge, um, you know, some of the, the the essential public good aspects of of the uh, of the internet of um, uh, these global public goods that you know, have, have very positive downstream effects. And what we are arguing, obviously these um, commercial supply side models have been very effective in driving out services and have you know, met in, you know, enormous needs across, across the world, pent up demand across the world, is that they should be balanced now with some you know, demand side evaluation when one is allocating spectrum, when one is um, uh, granting licenses. Um, and so, you know, the effects of this is what we see, that many of the things that are spoken about with the uh, Green New Deal around hyperglobalization is that it's, it's created global giants, it's benefited, you know, um, a number of players, it's created arguably a whole range of um, uh, capitalist perversions, I think um, Zuboff would call um, surveillance capitalism. Um, and so we draw re really very much on, on um, Brett Frischman's notion of social value and the commons to consider what policy, policy interventions could more equitably um, allocate resources. As I said, really, you can use this from, from spectrum literally to, to, to data, to technologies for smart cities or smart townships, um, to ensure meaningful access to quality um, public goods in the digital era. And as I said, what I've given here is two examples of how you might do this um, in relation to spectrum. Um, Frischman draws very strongly on, on Ostrom's work. Um, and then also looking at it in relation to data governance and particularly at the data governance level, and I'll just end off here, um, but the importance of, of um, understanding these uh, global public goods and how we need to um, operate far more effectively than we have at the global level um, to ensure their realization um, um, at the national level. Um, so I'm just going to leave it there because I, I see we, we have very much run out of time. And um, hopefully, if anybody's interested in the rest of this framework, we can either pick it up another time or uh, can just get in touch online. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. And even though we are now at uh, 3 p.m., uh, I think we can still have some questions. So are there any questions? Uh, yes, there's some hands raised, so please unmute yourself and ask the question. Hello. Uh, 
My name is Jacob. Uh, just firstly, I must comment the good work that you have done. And you have shown clearly that there's a problem with data access. We have seen a report recently by a competition commission showing that data is expensive in South Africa. And we have seen the service providers going to cut to, cut to ensure that the, the price does not go down. Is there any work that you are doing to ensure that the price of data comes down in South Africa? Because compared to other countries, definitely we, uh, our prices are very, very high. As a result, as you correctly pointed out, it is practically impossible for the rural poor and township people to access uh, uh, the so-called technology or use of these systems that we can work at home. Hence, I'm uh, just asking if, is there any uh, recommendation or something that you have done to, to pressurize the service providers to lower, to lower the price of data because the problem here is the price of data as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Jacob. Um, Jacob, as I was saying, is you know the the um, question of data pricing has sort of become very politicised and popularised. Um, and yes, absolutely, South Africa the the, the price of data is um, high in South Africa, and you saw the table compared to you know many other countries. So we we come about half. Um, out of 46 countries, we, we're, we're 19, 20, 17, 18. Um, the point I was making was that, you know, you can't just compare data and data. You can't just care, compare one gig of data, as we do for that ranking, um, here with one gig of data, um, you know, 40 kilometers outside of Accra, you might not have um, coverage. It's true that there are lower price, good quality networks in some places, but, you know, but, um, often outside of the South African case, the quality um, at a national level, outside of the main cities, you know, is, 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 is poor or is erratic. So the point I was making about um, the uh, price of data is that it's really, an, you know, it's an outcome of, um, it's an indicator of policy and regulatory failure or success. If you haven't got your prices right, um, it probably means you've not done something right in terms of your regulation, and we know that we haven't. So we haven't correctly, you know, done the market reviews to identify dominance in the market, to regulate, you know, the remedies for that would be wholesale access regulation, um, and that has not been done, which means that, you know, competitors can't compete with the incumbents. And this is a cycle for them because they're now making more profits, people are coming onto their networks, they have the um, capital to reinvest in the networks, get stronger networks, attract more people because they've got better networks. So it's an absolutely critical policy, uh, sorry, regulatory intervention that is required here and it's in our law and we haven't uh, done it. That's what we need to fix. So yes, lots of work on that. Please look at our website and, and lots of engagement on this um, because simply, you know, um, trying to just push, you know, at the retail level, just push back the prices is, is not going to achieve uh, positive outcomes. I think Jacob just wants to respond, right? Uh, otherwise, uh, are there other questions? I would love a question from Bill Freund, who I haven't uh, seen forever. I know, I, I wanted to see you again, <laughs> Alison. Well, uh, the only thing I can think of uh, asking is, um, I don't know, uh, I mean, you raise a very interesting question of access. But there's also a question of what the programming is like and what the value of it all is. Um, and I, I keep thinking of something I once read on Senegal that said that the two main uses of the smartphone were A, so people could participate in weddings and B, so that the men could watch wrestling competitions. Um, and uh, that's another side, how much uh, of what is out there is, is actually uh, going to benefit people in a serious way. Um, what kind of broadcasting in, in the broad sense do we have in IT? So I don't know what you think of that, Alison. It's not just, in other words, cost, but what do people get when it is available? Thank you very much, um, Bill. Um, we had a lot of uh, stuff at a policy level, you know, within the African Union and big international meetings um, where, you know, I, sh I, sh I shan't mention names, but a certain um, minister from a certain country would say, you know, we're not putting up public Wi-Fi because we do not promote pornography in our country. 
um, and mm. you know everybody. And it's absolutely true. The you know highest bandwidth usage by thing in various parts of the world is is pornography or whatever. The point is that you know everybody, rich and poor, are using it for multiple purposes. Um, because you're watching pornography or you um, you know social networking doesn't mean that you aren't using it to look for a job, that you aren't looking for it to mm. organize your hairdressing scheme if you're a hairdresser, um, or you know, um, using it to for now, particularly under lockdown, for educational yeah. purposes or whatever. So it you know it comes as a it comes as a whole package. You can't and and where people have tried to say, okay, we you know, we're gonna put it into schools and we're gonna prevent people you know, children from, you know, using that public Wi-Fi when they leave it or whatever. These are, you know, very counterproductive. This is a, a, mm. you know, a, a new way of existing. This isn't about, um, you know, investment in the old public broadcasting sense of, um, you know, public interest investment in order to get certain things. Mm. Um, this, is a, this is a way of existing and now under COVID a way of surviving. I just wanted to say on the social networking thing, which is also really important, is that because of the high cost of mobile phone calls, etc., social networking, which is what people it equates with internet penetration, internet penetration and social networking and use is the same um, across Africa and all the global south that we, we look at, um, is that people also use that as a very low cost communication uh, mechanism. So, you know, yeah. even before WhatsApp, although the data was expensive, it was much cheaper to buy a very small bit of data and then do texting and, you know, um, any kind of uh, ordinary communication. So the social networking is not only about, you know, posting Facebook, which you probably can't afford anyway um, to do uh, if you're a poor person in Africa. <laughs> It's a good answer. Uh, anybody else would like to ask something? Okay, I, I also have a question. Um, so you mentioned about uh, uh, digital taxation and so on. Um, and uh, I guess it's, it's a fact that with spread of internet uh, and the large investments that need to be made into infrastructure, Actually, these investments have externality on, on big platforms, including Google and Facebook. So they, they make more money the more people use internet and they're actually not paying for the infrastructure themselves. So uh, do you think, are there any solutions that may be implemented in South Africa to correct this externality? Um. Lukash, this is a really big question and an important question. Um, I'll try to, to be as brief and make just a few points on it, but it, 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 is, uh, it is an important question. So again, when I was speaking in the beginning about understanding the interplay and the relationship between infrastructure, infrastructure investments and infrastructure regulation and the OTTs or the, you know, uh, Facebooks, et cetera, the platforms running on, the, on top of them, um, from a policy point of view, it's important to understand what you are trying to do for what purpose. So in terms of the basic relationship between infrastructure um, providers and their investments and the take Facebook um, or YouTube or something like that, um, actually is a complementary service. So it's not a competitive service. And this is where I was speaking about looking at dynamic efficiencies and impacts on um, innovation and, um, you know, access and all sorts of things. So um, Facebook zero, uh, zero rated Facebook, um, free basics, et cetera, um, were argued as being anti-competitive because it didn't allow, you know, other um, people to present content in the, you know, in the, in the way that Facebook was. There, there absolutely is an th issue about Facebook as a whole. The zero rating of that, which allowed a number of people, it was a gateway for a number of people to come onto the internet, um, actually had very positive impacts in terms of getting people onto the internet. It also it may have had negative impacts on people not going onto local um, platforms, which weren't competing anyway, uh, unfortunately, because of Facebook. So the zero rating didn't impact that so much. Um, it did also assist some of the broadband players. So that was the period when um, Cell C was the only operator offering zero rated um, um, Facebook um, free basics, that was the period at which it was the only period at which it was able to claw some market share away from um, Vodacom um, and MTN. 
um, and it actually grew close to 20%, the biggest it's ever been um, um, in terms of market share. So that relationship actually enabled it to, um, to expand its, uh, its, its competitive base, its, its subscriber base. So the, the, the relationships are important. So the, the investment relationship and the, uh, the, the um, uh, multipliers that you speak of is precisely what the digital tax is trying to do. Because actually, the more people use data on the infrastructure, work, uh, infrastructure networks, the more the infrastructure players should be getting from it. Okay? Obviously, that reaches a point of congestion and you know, whatever, there, there are issues there. But that should it's beneficial should it initially be beneficial to both of them but the question then becomes um the operators the platforms are you know making million richest companies in the world um and not paying taxes not paying um you know on their revenues that they are generating in that country and that's what's so important about the digital global taxes because actually there was there would be nothing that if you said to, as you did said to me what can south africa do about that there was no way of getting Facebook or Google or somebody to pay um, ICASA, the Competition Commission, nobody could actually have got them because they don't fall in their jurisdiction. This way, with a global tax the, and the pushback against them and the pressure on them, um, the global tax will be you know, either two ways, drawn on the basis of the revenues from that country, even if you do not have presence. So, you know, I'm sure it's a a flick of an algorithm, um, Facebook can determine exactly which revenues are coming from, from where, um, would, it would go to that country f in terms of that revenue, or the idea with the digital solidarity tax is that it rather goes to a central pool and is then allocated kind of according to need, so to realize public goods at, at the national level. But absolutely, um, you know, I think, I think there are two slightly different issues around the um, competitive um, lack of investments in, in networks and um, the contribution to the tax bases in countries. But obviously very important in also providing an alternative to these absolutely miserable social networking taxes on the poor in uh, countries like Uganda. Et cetera. Thank, thank you for your answer. And there are some other questions. Uh, Jacob again, and maybe Ryan, he didn't ask the question yet. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, thank you, Alison, for the presentation. It was great. And if I can just follow up with um, what Mr. Freund had asked about. So, I mean, in South Africa, for instance, um, if you look at the, the most recent um, national education infrastructure management um, reports, 80% of, of public schools don't have internet connectivity for teaching and learning. I mean, do you see that as an important factor in all of this? I mean, have you given any thought to sort of um, internet in schools in general overall, um, both potentially as a means of providing um, wider communities with sort of connectivity, but also as part, as part of playing that role in education. Um, I was just wondering about that. Thanks. Is that Ryan? Um, yes, that was Ryan, me. Ryan, thank you very much Ryan. for that. I, absolutely, I have. <laughs> it has kept me awake at night. And not only has it uh, kept me awake at night, it's a central part of SA Connect. The, and that was done on the basis of, you know, a visit at that time by Minister Yunus Karim to Estonia, a lot of the literature demonstrating that, um, you know, public connectivity to clinics, et cetera, was all, you know, had all these positive um, multipliers. But actually the connection to schools is much greater. Um, and what has happened with the um, NHI and the um, connection of uh, public schools under um, SA Connect, as it's now been given to Infraco, et cetera, is that clinics have been prioritized. This is not a terrible thing because, you know, clinics are also important. And um, the idea was that, you know, you would connect all the schools, but you wouldn't connect a school first in Tsolo and then go to Lusiki Siki and Peg School. You know, you'd connect, go to Tsolo, you'd connect the municipality and the school and the courts and everything at one time. But basically the focus was on schools. And that's because of the very powerful effects um, and I mean, loads of literature, the, the impact of, you know, children taking um, uh, their digital knowledge back into the home, the use of public Wi-Fi, you know, once schools are connected, if it's open to the community, children actually acting as, as, as bridges, etc. So, um, I, mean, I mean, it's just, it is a travesty 
that these schools are not connected. They should have all been connected by, by 2016. It was possible, it was feasible. The uh, private sector operators and telecom were, 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 re were ready to do that. Um, if we just done, if we just stuck to the plan, um, we would be in hell at the moment, but it wouldn't be as bad as it is. Um, I think we can still have some questions, even though we are over time. All right, maybe I, I, I also have one, one more question related to digital inequality or inequality in general. So uh, with the increase in digitization now as a result of COVID, and we see this everywhere in the world, in Europe, in South Africa, that uh, lots of things will change. For instance, uh, I know, use of office spaces, uh, the ability to work from home and so on. And obviously people rely on internet connections. So how, how this may impact uh, the global inequality, you think, especially South Africa is quite vulnerable because of poor internet connections, as well as the rest of Africa. So not only the jobs that are high tech won't be placed there because you can't rely on infrastructure, but then on top of that is that big companies extract more profits, uh, like the big platforms and so on from these regions. And there are no really competitors in Africa that can uh, uh, that can compete with these big firms. Absolutely. I mean, um, Lukashi, when you say, you know, there's increased digitization and the impact on digital inequality, um, you know, it, one just has to look at South Africa to see that the increased digitization under COVID has resulted in increased digital inequality. What has happened? They've allowed the incumbent operators to get more spectrum, absolutely needed. I mean, you know, it's congestion was needed. It's a, it's a no-brainer. Regulators doing that all over the world. But they've given the incumbent operators um, more bandwidth. Um, they have offered their existing customers more capacity. Um, there have been efforts to zero rate um, university um, you know, portals and that kind of thing. So there have been some public interest efforts. But actually, digital inequality has been exacerbated. We see that. We see that by the students who've been stranded um, you know, away from their university access, who've not been able to join the online courses that are carrying on at universities. Um, you know, we see it with the inequality between schools, with you know, private schools largely going online and public schools just waiting now. I mean, that's why they, they, they're desperate to get back. So, I mean, at the national level, we see increased digital inequality because we're still not addressing these fundamental you know, um, uh, gaps that are there, the fundamental underlying um, um, issues um, that you know, should have been addressed to SA Connect, like the connection of schools, like the public Wi-Fi, et cetera. But um, of course, it does mean that those countries that are already more digitized, et cetera, will, um, you know, that, that will continue, that will be more so. I think more than countries, um, although of course, there's a kind of threshold, you know, it's like classical um, sort of, you know, metropole and periphery theory, is that we have this global elite, these global cities um, that are all connected and will be more connected. And within them, you know, um, probably, you know, in North America and Europe, less so than here, but there will be, you know, here there will be large numbers of people who are, who are not connected. But the South African infrastructure and, and um, uh, digital economy is relatively sophisticated and has a lot of potential to actually leverage the you know economic crisis globally um you know we, we have uh we were voted as the most favorable destination um for the business process outsourcing you know national fries etc so there's been a lot of talk about with, with that within um, government around uh, job creation so um it's i think you know in terms of us being connected um, we, those of us who are connected are going to be better off. Um, companies who've um, managed to survive this and are, you know, and probably if they're digital companies are, are probably going to be better off. Um, unless we make a really serious um, effort to address digital inequality and inequality, um, the majority of South Africans and Africans are going to be worse off. And I think the presidency is seized with that. Um, some people might argue too little too late, but I think uh, it's something that any 
um, you know, vaguely caring government at the moment is obliged to, to prioritize. Thank you. Ryan also raised hand, so maybe he can still ask a question. Oh, no, I'm sorry, that was from okay. earlier. I, I'm, I'm lowering it. Sorry about that. Right. Otherwise, uh, if there are no other questions, then I think we can finish for today. Uh, thank you very much again for your very interesting presentation. And uh, I would also welcome anybody that wants to present something to uh, contact me. Uh, on, on the website of ERSA, you will find the full list of different seminars that are taking place. And then next week, we'll have a seminar by George uh, Vivian Hugabon from uh, World Bank. He will speak about access to electricity and digital connectivity in uh, Senegal. So everybody is welcome to join next week as well. Thank you very much, Lukas, and everybody else. And uh, Lukas, just to um, remind anybody who's interested in working on these areas, these projects are all just sort of starting up. And um, if anybody's interested in collaborating, please do be in touch with us. Thank you again. And see you next week. Take care. Well, that was quite nice.